you're scalping and doing these really short-term trades, you are um, almost playing a losing game because you're literally playing against billion-dollar machines that do this every second of every day, and you just can't win that game over a long period of time. That doesn't mean you can't earn money. That doesn't mean you can't be successful in doing a scalping day trading pattern and stuff. It just means you're at a significant disadvantage because you are the weakest person in this game of playing because these bots are programmed and trade to be unfair to everyone else. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip through the book a little bit. We'll look at some things I highlighted and jot it down. Now we'll just talk about it. I highly recommend this read if you're a trader or you just want to understand financial markets more because the AI is so critical because it's I think he mentioned at around like 2001 or something, maybe like 30% of every trade transacted was from a bot moving to 2008, 2010. I think it was closer to like 70% of every single trade was a bot. That's just, that blows my mind. This market is not a free market. That's another thing I want to take note of is that the people that created these bots and machines to do these trades, they had good intentions in mind. They wanted the market to be free because prior to the machine trading and all this, people, what, they, what you would do is you would send an order in and the buyer, or you send an order into like the, the money maker river. He would uptick, charge you more on the stock and he would take a small commission, kind of like a car salesman, right? They're going to charge you maybe an extra thousand on the car so they can get that extra thousand for themselves. The people that created these machines thought that was very unfair, unjust, and it was just a little scammy. So they created the machines to better tighten the spread so that the commission made on each transaction from those brokers or dealers would be significantly less. Then over time, things just escalated and now it's just kind of anarchy in the market. Anyway, it's a great, excellent read. Scott Patterson did a great job. He is a um, staff reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I like the Wall Street Journal. I try to read that every day. So we briefly go over some things it goes into. Machine vs. Machine, the birth of the machine. The triumph of the machine and the future of the machine. And then the year of the glitch. Titles don't really do too much actually, but it's got a cool font. Dark pools. So basically, those who don't know, a dark pool is basically a start of a light pool. Light bulbs, you know, basically just any market right now, or the stock market. You go in, you buy a stock, you send your order in, and like TD Ameritrade or Schwab or something, you see your quote, you see the price, you see the bid, the ask, and you just buy it. These dark pools, but they are, are, he actually gives a definition. The title of this book does not entirely refer to what is technically known in the financial industry as a dark pool. Narrowly defined, dark pool refers to a trading revenue that mass buy and sell orders from the public market. Rather, I argue in this book that the entire United States stock market has become one vast dark pool. Orders are hidden in every part of the market, and the complex algorithm AI-based trading system that controls the EBBB or ebb and flow of the market are cloaked in secrecy. Investors and our esteemed regulators are entirely in the dark because the market is dark. So basically, these institutions and stuff, what they can do is they can send order flow in like some literally darkness like they want 10 shares of apple or they want like a million shares of apple at like let's say 100 bucks or something make it easy that isn't going to be shown to everyone else because the bots pick that up and they just start buying apple so they send these this information through these dark literally darker just because it's masked a masked order flow system and then it gets executed there so it's hidden from other bots the whole thing honestly is a giant shit show it's very hard to explain. I don't really fully understand how all this gets executed, but it happens in milliseconds. It's so fast. Um, I'm getting off hand. Let's just get into it. Basically, that's Dark Pool. I'm just going to go over some stuff that I highlighted. Um, okay. Big game. I'm going to read something and then I'm going to talk about it. The big game in this hunt became known as the whale. A whale. An order from a Leviathan fund company such as Fidelity. Vanguard or Leg Mansion, Mason. If the outgoes could detect the whales, they could then have a very good sense of whether stock was going to rise or fall. 
call in the next few minutes or seconds. They either could trade ahead or get out of its way. The bottom line, mom and pop retirement accounts were full of mutual fund handling.
sheriff's talk. It's not, it, or it wasn't in 2012 going to an exchange. It was going within these programs, within the company, and then going someplace that they chose that would benefit them in some way. That's basically what I'm saying. But again, I don't really know everything, obviously. I'm just reading a book and talking about my thoughts behind it. So the zero plus one trade is a brilliant execution. I heard about this in a podcast a few years ago, and I I didn't really understand. I mean, I understood it, but I didn't get how they did it. But basically, there is a hidden order flow where there was. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically, it's a strategy that you get almost no risk for reward. It's an important scalping strategy, but you can't like do this. Like, don't be like, oh, I want to try to do you, a normal person, without the program or bot or whatever, and the order flow cannot do this, and that's why you basically won't. You can't compete against this if you're scalping or day trading or trying to catch the bid and sell or bid and ask on a level two. You're just not fast enough. You're not. These things operate millions of a second. We'll get that in a minute. It's too fast. But if you're interested in this type of order flow, look at the zero plus zero plus uh, order flow or trade execution. Because it's uh, I can't really explain it in a way that would make good sense. So in May 2012. SEC Chairman Mary Shapiro told Congress that the Commission's tool for collecting data and surveying our market are wholly inadequate to the task of overseeing the largest equity markets in the world. Scott said it was as if the FBI admitted that they could not track organized crime. The SEC did not even understand their own market. Another example of one of the people who, uh, I guess, uh, Scott Patterson interviewed, he basically said that, again, it was nothing less than taking a transfer of wealth from ordinary Americans trying to save for retirement into their pockets of the financial elite. Because you're just taking pennies over dollars, but that adds up over time. So here, this is where Scott mentions uh, these things like phantom orders, basically, where, so you have these sophisticated bots now, these AI working together. They can identify whales, they can identify, you know, hedge funds coming in the market, they can identify different limit order flows or, or different order flows. So now you gotta play a different game. You have to have these order flows where it fakes people out or fakes other bots out, right? You say, oh, there's a whale over here when there isn't, it's actually an illusion. And then bots go to there and you, you fake it. It's a very complicated game, which doesn't make any sense in the people Investor that is scary. 
scary because of that volatility. But we're, we're putting our hands and our faith in a market built on things we don't even understand. And the people that built them don't really understand either. If you ever wondered why there are circuit breakers in the market, so let's say, you know, a stock, a stock gets halted at like 15% or more in a minute, or if the market crashes with 5% in a minute, it uh, breaks it, or it, uh, the market gets halted. Basically, uh, I forgot what year, it probably says in here, but they, the SEC put, made this like a law that there has to be market-wide circuit breakers. So it would trigger a stop in the trading in case something happened because it needed time for these algorithms and bots to cool off. It's not, I mean, it obviously there is some thing that has to do with like the actual like, people trading, like, hey, like cool off too. But it's mostly for these bots because if things are in the fan and these bots just like they can panic and they're lagging behind and they don't understand, it, it's very dangerous. So there has to be some circuit breaker stop to the market. I think that's very fascinating. I mean, it makes sense. It's just fascinating. I love this uh, quote he put, uh, mom and pop investors innocently believed the stocks they owned were their stocks not fizzling electronic bits of information to be toyed with by whiz kids running supercomputers. It just shows the, um, the fragility of investing in the stock market. Because you literally don't own, if you don't touch it, you don't really own it, right? I mean, yes, do you own those, bit, those shares of Apple or whatever, yeah. But like, again, it's just an electronic bit of information. It's, how do you explain that you own it? How do you show you kind of own it? I mean, obviously there are ways of showing it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying me looking at my computer and saying, oh, I have, let's say one share of Amazon. Like, I own that. But do I really own, what, I, what do I own that number on the screen? I get, I own this. I just don't have this thing in it. Like, like, I own this highlighter. I have it. It's not some electronic bit of information in the ether. I guess that's what I'm saying. Obviously, there's laws and stuff that make it. So, you, you know, you have these things. But I'm just saying that I don't know what to look at it from a different point of view sometimes. Companies were spending millions of dollars. Right? Okay. According to one estimate, one millisecond advantage could be worth hundred million dollars. What they were doing was running these fiber optic cables across like the ocean or across the land obviously or like hundreds of miles or thousands of miles or whatever that could cost millions of dollars so they can save milliseconds on their order flows. Milliseconds on their order flows for a hundred million dollars. That is insane. The amount of money being pumped in because of how much money you could make is absolutely incredible. He mentions how, like, if this money, or one person he interviewed, had this money to, like, solve cancer, diseases, and stuff, or feed the hunger, like, man, like, I don't know, but one of the guys actually he interviewed, too, said that he wanted, or he was building these, building these bots because he wanted to solve a genocide I don't remember exactly where, but he wanted to, or he wanted to stop genocide. He wanted to fund all this money. So that can be like solved and I mean I believe them because a lot of these people when you're making that kind of money, it's like you don't know, you want to start doing things larger than yourself. Especially if it's a single person with their goal. But if you're in this institution, in this bank or company, it's not the individual. I forgot I went on a little tangent, but this is very important. This was something uh, a speaker said at one of this trading exchange meetings. Um, we have to always remember, you know, why exchanges exist, why markets exist. And, and ex so I'll just read the quote. An exchange used to be placed. Yes, a physical place where people together to buy or sell, hoping to achieve the best possible price for themselves, he said. The more
more, the exchange was able to attract all of the buy and sell inter interest in a product. The more prices on the exchange would reflect the true state of supply and demand. This is why markets exist. I want a product. I want to pay this for it. You want to sell it for about this price. When all these prices and things are aggregated together, there's less spread and volatility between the prices. And things are, and again, liquidity breeds liquidity. That's a common trend through this whole book. The more things, the more people and things are in buying things at whatever price of, the, of a similar product, the better the valuation of that price and product have that relationship. That's why exchanges exist. But when it comes to when the bid and spit and ask are so tight, when these things are bouncing order flows, it's just anarchy and it's not a free market or system. Again, this was 2012, and he mentioned that, again, people, they were messing with these bots. They were doing the order flows, buying into this, that forbidden spread, but now they're building, or they were building bots that could invest and trade off of stock fundamentals and economic variables. Again, this is a hard thing to do, right? You need, and they mentioned how they pulled on newspapers. They found, like, news articles, SEC filings on earnings reports and stuff into that analysis within the program. That's hard to do within the program, and it's hard to do as an individual. And right now, the world we live in, I can say, like, hey, I can do that by myself. I can probably beat a bot because I have more experiences. But they probably thought the same thing maybe 50 years ago about chess. Oh, you know, they, or maybe they even think about robots back then or AI, but like chess could never, or a human would always beat a computer at chess. Well, guess what? The computer has beaten humans at chess and it probably will, or it can most of the time, or almost every time. It's only a matter of time before this gets replaced. Even investing will probably get replaced. I don't know. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. I don't think it's right. I'll see ya.